صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَتَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّا خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا يَوْمَ نَدُوا كُلَّ نَاسٍ فمن أوتي كتابه بيمينه فأولئك يغرؤون كتابهم فأولئك يغرؤون كتابهم ولا يملمون فتيلا صدق الله العلي العظيم
صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد Okay, welcome to class number eight, and thank you, um, Brother Hussein, for the beautiful recitation, and apologies for the delay. So um, we're going to begin with a spiritual reminder for today, which is just a, a general reminder, um, but inshallah, something that we can all reflect upon. It's a hadith which says that on the day of judgment, during the accounting of deeds, there will be a time when, Okay, this paraphrase here, where you'll be so happy that if that happiness were divided among all the dwellers of the fire, they would be distracted from the pain of the fire. That is the time that you obeyed your Lord. And there will come a time when you'll be so frightened and worried that if that fear and that worry were to be spread among all the dwellers of the garden, the blessings of the garden would become bitter for them. That is the time that you disobeyed your Lord. So, you know, when... when the, the, this hadith, uh, it's a good reminder of the hereafter and of, you know, our final destination. Sometimes, especially as caregivers, parents, um, when we get caught up with our family members, um, sometimes we lose sight of, you know, the bigger picture. And so it's always important for us to remember that. Like, what are we here for? Okay, so um, that is the agenda. And for those of you who might be joining us for the first time online or watching a recording. Um, this is a class which has been taking place um, now. This is the eighth session. You can access the previous um, sessions on the YouTube channel, and you can also get access to the notes as well um, through the Google Classroom. Um, this is the last uh, class in this course. Um, and um, for those of you who were auditing the class, that's fine. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, you benefited. For those of you who or taking it as a student, then you've been doing the homework regularly, and alhamdulillah, many of you have. Um, the students who are able to submit homework for all eight weeks, they will get a course completion certificate that will be, inshallah, delivered to them via email um, at some time in the, inshallah, not so distant future. Um, and mashallah, you know, many of you have been really working hard at the homework and keeping on, t on, um, on track. Um, in terms of the punctuality, I think we need to work on that part of it <laughs> because today, unfortunately, there wasn't anybody here um, when the class started. And so um, that's something that we need to, uh, for next, inshallah, if we want to continue this, we need to fix that. Okay. Um, alhamdulillah, throughout the course of these eight sessions, we were able to um, cover uh, some of the critical um, principles for Islamic family building. Um, and, you know, it's been, we've been going slow but steadily through these. Um, we talked about, um, in general, like, what's the importance of having the principles? How do we use them? You know, how they have to be used, you know, together as a package. It's not just taking something and then taking something from something else. If you use them as a package, you get something which is very comprehensive. Um, we talked about sukun, and there was a number of, of discussions regarding that. We talked about mahabba and love. And today we are um, going to the new topic, which is respect and dignity. This is like yet another dimension on one, one of the other principles. Now, inshallah, if Allah gives us the tawfiq, then um, in the next semester of this course, which would begin sometime after Ashura, um, we would cover um, the topics that are listed there, which are um, respect and dignity. We, we're going to just start that today. There's more to it freedom and dignity, like w the whole discussion of freedom, how much freedom, why freedom, um, at the different development stages, how much freedom, um, and temperament and personality, like how do we understand something about the temperament of our children and how does that affect the way that we deal with them, and then some of the other topics potentially would be media and devices for children, and then before and after childbirth, what to do. Okay, I want to first uh, look back at uh, homework number six, which was some weeks ago, um, and we had a couple of weeks off. So just to remind, to remind everyone that the topic there was about ways of showing love. And um, one of the questions was, like, pick one of the hadith and talk about why that was relevant to you. 
So one of the students says that you know this hadith, the wound caused by the tongue is more severe than the wound caused by a spearhead. They said that we would never even think about appro approaching a projectile weapon, which is typically used in battle from a distance to use it against our parents, wives, and children. That was a really profound point. You know that, like when you have a s spear, you don't come up close; you throw it from far, right? And then you only throw it at somebody who you're sure is like your enemy. I mean, or you're hunting or something. You're not going to throw it at anybody who is like not an enemy, right? So. Here, the Imam is saying, that, look, you're doing something that could potentially be worse than that act of throwing a spear, right? So first of all, like, don't be so distant. Get up close and form those bonds and like, try to you know, like, work, through thi work things through like, your connections. And the second thing is be very careful, you know, be very, very vigilant about um, how you use the tongue. And then one other student said that the way we speak to our kids will become their inner voice and affect how they see themselves. If we speak to them harshly, then they will have low self-image and always be critical of themselves and their achievements. They will also be susceptible to abuse by others because they will think that that is how someone who loves you talks to you. But if we are gentle with them, then inshallah, they will have a high self-image and not accept abuse from others because they know what healthy relationships should look like and they will know their value. What do you guys think about that comment? Yeah, generally speaking... Okay, I'm getting heads nodding. I thought that was a great comment. Excellent point and definitely something to keep in mind. Like th the effects of um <coughs> this you know this comment really reminds us that the effects of, you know, the what we do with our children like they're they're seen generationally. Like I mean this thing something can be seen, seen like many many years down the line how somebody now is reacting to the people how they're treating them. So, that was an excellent point and also is tied to our topic for today. The second thing was about, okay, what, when you actually are attentive, you're trying to like demonstrate love practically, what do you do differently? So I had a lot of like really good examples from the parents about when I did these things, like I saw this difference. Um, and you know, it was great. Like I think that if we wanted to write a book and you know, put in anecdotes, like we have plenty of them, mashallah, to like say that, okay, this is what happens when you apply these. And you know, th this is one of the things that's unique about this class is that um, you get a chance to put into practice what you're, you know, what we're covering. And um, it, it's just, it's really nice to see how, like, you know, parents are saying, look at it, this is what it's, I'm seeing this changing my relationship with my kids. And that's the power of the principles of the Ahlul Bayt, you know, I mean, they, they are the masters. They know how things work. So m when my daughter became frustrated and said bad words, I called her with love and I reminded her gently that those choices are bad. This method is so powerful. Right, so that's great, you know, like love and then choices. Okay, I smile at my children in the morning when they wake up and at night before they go to bed, but I need to remember to keep a smile on my face throughout the day when speaking to them and looking at them. And this student went on to say that, I think that they said that um, when they did that, they noticed a difference. Today we made dinner time story time, and so we each told a story from our day. We all loved it and got to hear a story from the kids' day that we wouldn't have otherwise heard. And normally, I guess, dinner for them is a struggle. You know, they have younger kids, <laughs> and they... Yeah, so, so, but here, like, they're like, oh, I'll actually work for us. Great, alhamdulillah. Um, do you guys use s stories at dinner time? Oh, you're busy eating? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But, uh, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great thing. Like, you know, and you can, like, kind of build up the anticipation. You can be like, um, I, have, I have something really interesting to tell you guys. And be like, oh, but first finish half your food. You know, <laughs> so then you're like, like and then well, uh, then they'll, they'll finish half. You know. Okay, um, I've been trying to be more gentle in my speech, but still being firm on our set guidelines. So this is one of the parents speaking. Example: So and so, you already had a sweet. Save it for tomorrow and tell me what you think of the dessert. Instead of, you know the rules. Drop it. Okay. Um, any comments about this one? This last one. Great, great, great point. So, um, sister says that, first of all, like we shouldn't assume that our kids just like have memorized the rules and they're always like at their forefront. I mean, they're kids, right? 
and um, the importance of how you say it. But so do you guys, uh, okay, let me put it this way. Is there, uh, could we say it even a better way than what the, what the student says? Is there a better way of putting it, a better way of phrasing it? Than the first one. Anybody? No? So it's fine? Okay, so. Okay. Okay. All right. Going once, going twice. Salam Mahdi, anything? Any better way of phrasing it? It's good? Perfect, perfect. Okay. All right. My humble comment, I don't know what you guys think about it. My humble comment is that, first of all, it's a suite, right? What's the big deal? Like, why are, are we, like, so, like, you know, I mean, come on. Like, there's, there's things we want to really, really, like, kind of confirm on. But sometimes, like, let's say that, you know, it's, it's, I understand that we need to have rules, but, I mean, let's say that they really want it, right? It's, like, really, like, okay, well, maybe once in a while we have to be a little bit, like, kind of, you know, a little bit giving, giving give and take, right? Like, there's some things we want to be very firm on, right? And other things we do a little bit, right? Second of all is that what if we phrase it as a question instead of, like, saying it as a thing, right? Like, um... Um, so you already had one. What do you think about saving this for tomorrow? Right. So then you're putting it as a question. Maybe it would be a little bit come off a little bit better. Now you know, of course, like you have to see what the situation is, and maybe in in that situation they need to be said, they need to be told it, and maybe it's a really big deal, like you know, that's it's going to cause a problem, whatever, like that. Um, but sometimes that question, use of a question, can just like um, be more um, attentive to preserving the dignity of the person you're talking to. Exactly. And it, 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 it really, it, you're not using the power dynamic here. You need to use that sparingly when you really have to use it, right? There's no need to, right? I mean, it's over a suite, right? So you can just like really approach, okay, you know, how about this? What if this, you know, what if you do that, right? And sometimes you can do that and at the same time you take it away too. So pretty much like you know, it's not there anymore, okay? So that's just an idea, okay, just, I, I think that, mashallah, this parent, of, of course, is doing a great job by thinking about this, but that's just an idea. Okay, my son dropped milk for the third time in a row in the morning. Usually, I would have lost my mind, but I chose differently. I did not get angry with him, but just came next to him and explained to him that it would be best if he could fill the bowl with a little less milk, so that when he picks it up, it doesn't spill. Great. Alhamdulillah. Right? I mean, after all, who cries over spilled milk, right? So, okay, I asked you to change in your pajamas 10 minutes ago, and you still haven't to... Um, do you need help getting ready for bed? Okay, great, excellent. So there were many other examples of these types of things that I was hearing from uh, the students who did this homework. So keep it up, mashallah. Um, this type of thing, like, it really does take, like, um, attentiveness, practice. It's not just, like, one week, but we keep it up, and eventually it can become kind of a habit. Like, this is the approach that we take. All right. Okay, so from the last class, uh, we talked about different ways of demonstrating love. Um, we were focused on um, from this point where we say that effects of being ill-mannered, right? Lack of influence on the children. Somebody who is ill-mannered, they might get temporarily, they might find some power over their children, but it's not going to last. Okay, also it can create enmity as opposed to really forging that strong bond. We talked about humility. Like when it's done correctly, when a, when a parent is able to demonstrate humility, tawadu'a correctly, um, then it can result in gaining authority. Because when somebody does that, they actually find izzah, right? People, people are attracted to the authority of people who lead um, in a humble manner. Okay, our Prophet ﷺ was the best of leaders and he was the most humble of people. So this is a lesson for us. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not firm on our principles. That we it doesn't mean that we're um, we're just like you know y you you tell me what to do type of thing. Um, but it does mean that when we're interacting with our children, we do so from this perspective that this is somebody who is God's creation, right? And they um, are better than me, right? They're and they have the potential to be one of the awliya of Allah. Okay, truthfulness, including fulfilling promises. We talked about that. And then gift giving. The material value of the gift itself is not as important as how it's given. One of the students said that for Father's Day, they, um, so they were applying these things. So they said that they, they bought flowers. Well, okay, so she said that she bought flowers. And, um, you know, she and her kids, they, they just sat with the father and, and talked. 
right? And she said that, like, they found that very refreshing. Like, it wasn't, like, elaborate. It wasn't, like, super, like, let's go to all these crazy places. They're just flowers, and then just had nice, like, discussion around the flowers, right? And and so this is this is important, right? That, um, you know, the uh, sometimes something small, but then, like, the written words that accompany it or, you know, like, these type of opportunities that are created, that's something which is wonderful. Okay. Our topic for today is karama, um, dignity and self-worth. And I'm going to be explaining how this is one of the key principles in raising children from an Islamic perspective. But I first want to quote a first uh, few of the um, ayat and hadith around this, um, as we heard recited earlier. Allah says, أَعُوذُ اللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا We have honored the children of Adam. وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ We carried them over land and sea and provided them with all the good things. وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا We preferred them with a complete preference over many of those who we have created. Okay, human beings are not small fish. Okay, human beings are the best of God's creation. Okay, and when you have, you know, the honeybee versus the fly. The fly is expected to do what a fly does. The honeybee is expected to be more noble than the fly, right, because of what it has been endowed with, right? The Quran says that to the honeybee, um, you know, that kuli uh, washrabi, right, like eat and drink, and then it says that go and set upon a light on those good things. Like, don't just go anywhere. You go on those good things, Right, because it's a bee. And that's what a bee is supposed to do. And it needs to draw out like the sweet thing. So it's not going to go to like these really bad areas. Now, human beings, Allah says, is that look at they might not be able to swim like a fish or be able to like roam the land like a beast, but they have means that God has provided um, to them where they can accomplish what other creatures cannot accomplish. They're very, very um, capable. And so this karama, this honor, is something which is God-given, and it is something which every human being is supposed to um, feel a sense of like dignity because of it, inherent dignity. Now, that dignity can be enhanced um, through uh, taqwa, in the akramakum and Allahi atqaakum, but there is that basic level of dignity. And if we wanted to say, like, what is... One of the, if, I, if we look at, for example, the troubles that we're seeing in, in the teenage generation, so that, that level, right? What is, and, and speaking from somebody who is an educator, I get a chance to spend time with a lot of younger people. What is the number one parenting mistake that parents make when it comes to their children that, uh, that makes them as teenagers suffer tremendously, where we see mental health problems, where we see like depression, we see suicide, right? The number one issue, I would say right now, is lack of understanding this principle correctly. So I cannot emphasize this enough, right? That in parenting, if we do not observe the principle of karama, of of recognizing, affirming, affirming the essential and inherent dignity that every human being has, including my children, then I am doing a great disservice to them. And it's, it is going to have ramifications when they get older. Okay. Now, what are what is some of the wh- why like why is it that why is it that that um, karama is so important from an Islamic perspective, right? Our our goal is to to be uh, to be ab- to be an abd, right? Abudiya, to be a, a servant of God and dedicated to a life of servitude. Now, what is the path to that? We see Amir Mu'minin Ali Sam say, "Man karumat alayhi nafsuhu." Lam yuhinha bil ma'asiyah. Somebody who has dignity, they honor themselves, they honor their soul, they will not abase or lower their themselves to disobedience. They just they, they rise above that. Right? They're not they're just not gonna it's just not gonna happen, right? They're way they're way, they're way above and beyond that. Okay, so not disobeying God is our purpose for our being here. To be, in his, to be in his obedience is our purpose. So to accomplish that, we need to have the sense of honor. That's the best way. Okay. Now, of course, you know, uh, fear of punishment, uh, promise of reward, those are great. 
of course, like, you know, the take, having the role models of the Ahlul Bayt al those are extremely important. But all of these are also meant to help us understand that, like, look at, if you are, if, if God can put you, a, and you're the only creature that is, has been selected for this great test, Right? You're the only ones who have this opportunity to reach something which is so great that it can't even be described. But at the same time, you can fall lower to a point which is so dismal that you can't even describe it. Right? That gives us a sense of dignity. Hey, you're, you're a human being. Right? God chose you. Right? I'm, I'm elite. Right? I'm not like just small fish. Right? I'm a part of the elite. Right? Th- that's the sense. Right Now, how do we convey that to our children that you're elite, right? You're not small fish, right? You're you're playing in the big leagues here, right? You're ex- like you're, the expectations are you are high, and you know you deserve like to be something which is very high, right? This is the thing. So this is one hadith from Imam Ali al Islam. Another one: Whoever honors his self will be less disagreeable and combative, right? We all, you know, <laughs> would like to have you know, the relationships with our children where it's a bit easier. Sometimes, like, you know, where there's a lot of, like, conflict and friction. We go back into the drawing board and we're like, well, what's, what's wrong here, right? Is it something which is maybe, um, you know, a lot of times it goes back to diet and, um, let's say, sleep. Sometimes it's my approach, the example I'm setting, and many other factors that could be causing this. But this is huge, right? That in general, people who have self-dignity, they get along better with other people. Okay, another hadith. Whoever honors himself, his lower desires will be weakened because that person is too, they're like a knight, right? The knight has chivalry, right? The knight is magnanimous, knight is noble. That nobility, that nobility prevents them from um, engaging in those things which are beneath their status. Okay, now, where does this self-worth and dignity come from? Okay, how, how do we foster it? So number one is awareness of one's position in creation. You know, as as a child, um, you know, is growing up, right? They start to understand more. They see how that they are not just like anybody else, right? They're not like just like any other creation. They're a human being, and they start to see the value of that. They they interact with other human beings, and they see how how like incredible the values that they they sh- show. Imagine, you know, we had the opportunity to to be in contact with the living wali of Allah, like the, the imam of the time. Imagine seeing his, his generosity, his kindness, his love, right? His, um, just the way he, that person is, right? And, okay, we don't have the opportunity, but we have opportunity to see, like, you know, their students, right? Or we, have to, we can read about them, we hear their stories. And so as a child is growing up, they're realizing that, oh, there's, there's something which is like this incredible, you know, example, and I can be like that. That's part of their journey. It's a journey of learning. But we all know that it takes a while for a child to get to this level of understanding. So where does it come from before that? It comes from the takrim or ikram that is done to that child, when, especially when they're younger. Right? This is super important. Right? Because when that child is being treated like they are you know, something special. Right? I, told, I, told, I, gave you, I gave this example. This is from a, a, a non-Muslim author who is writing about marriage. It's a good point, though. So he said that they went to the museum. I told you, right? They went to the museum, and um, they um, they were there, and then, like, you know, his, his they were there with her young daughter, and there was a Rembrandt painting. So the daughter was attracted by the Rembrandt painting, so she went, and she wanted to touch it. And so her mom stops her and says to her that, don't touch it, that's a Rembrandt. Okay? You don't touch that. Right, so then, like the husband was reflecting, he's saying that, like, look at this, like, you know, that's the, because it's a, a work of art that's produced by Rembrandt, right? It has so much value. Now here's somebody like my spouse, who's a who's a work of art that's produced by God, right? So imagine, like, you know, that I mean, here we're saying this is a Rembrandt, like, this is a work of God, like they have so much value, right? I can't just go and treat them however I want to, right? And so, some, this is, so when it's parents, right, like I'm thinking that like, look at what right do I have to sit there and God forbid raise a hand to my child or like, you know, shout at them, right, or make fun of them or call them names, right, or to dishonor them or to, dis- I mean, these are things which, you know, th- like the same thing, you know, you wouldn't go touch the Rembrandt, right, like 
this is a work of art here that somebody else, this is God's work. I have to give them that dignity. I have to show that dignity to them. Okay, the third, third way is training a child um, on the makarim, like the most noble traits of Allah, teaching them what's good and what's bad. Right? But that, that, of course, requires like, you know, education. So um, it's important at all stages for, that, for a child, for a human being to be treated with dignity, but especially in the first seven years because that is the main way that they come to understand like, who they actually are. Now, we're going to go into a little bit of a discussion here about parenting style. These are, these are like really important um, topics, you know, of like when we're trying to like work on our parenting, right? And we're going to take a little bit of a detour and look at what um, the kind of some of the stuff that's been done by researchers in the field of parenting. And then we're going to come back to the Islamic perspective and tie it back to dignity. So in the... Um, in the field of the academic study of parenting styles, um, in 1983, these two individuals, they came up with a model to describe how parents generally the parent their children. And the reason why they're doing that is to study which parenting style is more, most effective. Okay? Now, of course, they, they're understanding of effectiveness is according to what they're looking for. They're looking for children who are academically strong, who are, they have good social emotional health, right? They're good citizens and whatever else, you know, whatever criteria they have. However, for us, for us to study this is very interesting. It's very useful to see what they came up with. And then we want to see how is it that Islam views this. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what they came up with and then we're going to look at the, what Islamic uh, scholars have said on this topic. Brother Hassan, did you something? Yeah. Um, someone asked, what if the parents were ignorant with the first child, but when they learn and uh, change themselves with the other children, the other children feel that, and then uh, they feel the sibling causing friction in the family. Um, the older child is 12, and the other siblings are 6 and 4. So we, we all, you know, we all make mistakes, right? And, you know, there, we all go through periods of learning and refine our practice, okay? And God's system is one where he doesn't expect perfection from us, right? I mean, we have maghfirah, we have toba, right? We, we have the process of learning, we dispel our ignorance and all these things, right? And um, we also, God created us with hearts that are compassionate. So, um you know, that child, you know, the, the parents can sometimes explain to them that, like, look at, you know, we made a mistake, right? We shouldn't have done this to you, right? Um, they can also, you know, the children also, like, they, they understand when parents have double standards. Now, let's say that they've um, understood something better, right? So now what they're doing is they're going to be treating their older child also differently than they were uh, treated in the past. Um, but yeah, you know, the the parent, the child will notice. Will say, that, okay, well, my my younger kid, my younger siblings are treated are differently. You guys didn't do those things with me. Why? So the parents just have to. At, at some point, they can, uh, you know, at, they need to take the right strategy. But at some point, they will need to tell them, look, it, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. We're sorry. Okay. okay. So, what they found was that um, vast majority of parents they do one of four parenting styles. Okay, um, either they're permissive, they're uninvolved, they're authoritarian, or they're authoritative. Now, what is the difference between these? Um, it goes based on two axes. One of them is the axis of how much love and warmth and responsiveness they have to their child. And the second one is the axis of how much, how much do they set high expectations and demand compliance to those expectations, okay? Now, if we go to each one of these, like, um, for example, a parent who is permissive has very low, um, you know, standards, but they have a lot of love and a lot of, like, warmth towards their child. I mean, love, we put in parentheses here, uh, quotation marks, because we've said that love is not just, like, you know, smiling and hugging and these things. Love, true love is, like, where you want the best for that person in this world and the hereafter. So, but anyway... Now, that type of parent is going to be lenient, accepting, indulgent. They're going to avoid confrontation, few rules, non-directive, 
low expectations. And their motto is, hey, you're the boss. You call the shots. Okay, and we see this sometimes, right, where um, by the time the child is, you know, in the teenage years, like the parents don't have anything to say, right? They're like, hey, you know, this, they're going to call them. You tell them, you know, we'll have to talk to them. You know, we'll, we'll make an appointment you can talk to them. Okay, now, there's the uninvolved parent who is, um, who is also has no like sort of like kind of expectations and doesn't hold doesn't have doesn't hold their children accountable to anything, um, but they also lack that warmth. So basically, they're kind of like, yeah, we have a room for you. You know, we're gonna give you food, but you kind of sort things out yourself, right? Like this is where the child's always gonna be on the device. They're gonna be out of the home. They're gonna be leaving home when they're 18. They would leave earlier if they could, and that sort of thing. So this parent is not really interested in what happens. The little time, right? There's other things that they're involved with, priorities. They're absent from the picture. They're neglectful. They're passive, right? Like, I, I, I always remember this example of, like, this one student who said that this was in, in a different city. This was, well, but the student was complaining, saying that, like, you know, I live with my mom and my sister. Every day um, when we get home, you know, the three of us, we get on our devices and that's the way it is for the rest of the evening. You know, that was their life, right? And that's just like this depressive, right? But in, anyway, that's what, that's the type of thing. And then there's the authoritarian where um, there's a lot of like uh, expectations, a lot of, you know, holding accountable and a lot of like sort of standards that they're expecting, but there's no warmth or love. And so this one is where, um, because I said so, it's all about, well, hey, I'm, I'm in charge here, I'm the boss. Right, and this was used a lot, especially in the previous generation, like our parents, maybe generation, um, very structured, you know, emotionally distant, a lot of punishment, a lot of clear rules. Hey, you're getting out of line here, you know, hey, you know, whatever, kind of like drill sergeant type of thing. And then there's one which is a combination where, yes, you have clear standards, right? You have, um, you want the child to be, you have a growth m mindset approach, right? You want the child to always be striving for higher and higher standards, um, but you also have a lot of warmth. You understand their situation, right? If they fail to meet the standards, right, it's still a success in some way. You turn it around and make it a success for them. You're there for them. Um, you're responsive. Let's talk about it, right? Let's talk about it approach, okay? Now, what what did they see happen which, with each one of these approaches? This is really interesting, right? Like, according to their study. So, the outcome that they saw with the authoritarian, like the drill sergeant approach, was lower academic performance, less, less self-esteem, poorer social skills, some cases mental illness, drug, alcohol, abuse, and delinquency. So that, that wasn't working for them, right? That approach, no. Okay, what about the permissive approach? What they saw was impulsive behavior, right? Because the child has not been taught etiquette. The child is not taught about, like, conformance to, to a higher standard. Everything's from themselves, whatever you want, whatever, uh, according to your fancy. So impulsive behavior, egocentric, it's all about you, poorer social skills, um, because they, they, they're never pushed out of their comfort zone in a, in a, in a correct manner, right? Part of uh, allowing our children to develop is to understand that, okay, some of them might be very comfortable in their own sort of, depending on their temperament, in their own like comfort zone, so sometimes we need to like be pushing them out of that zone to allow them to grow. Um, and problematic relationships, because they never saw this, never had like that relationship, proper relationship with uh, a parent. Neglectful um, is also impulsive, delinquency, drug or alcohol abuse, suicides, because they lack, um, they lack dignity, right? They lack a sense of like, you know, that I'm, I am something important, right? I'm not important because my parents couldn't really care about me. My father doesn't care about me. My mother doesn't really care about me. Um, whatever, and there's no really nothing I'm really striving for. And then the authoritative one, they saw the best results with. Um, higher academics, more self-esteem, better social skills, less mental illness, lower delinquency. Okay, now the question is, what is the Islamic approach to this? Or do we accept this, right? Now this is where I want to um, quote, oh, okay, wait, wait, there's something else I wanna mention first, okay. So even though a lot of people, they fall into these four categories. Recently, there's been some new types of parenting approaches. Okay, and I'm mentioning these because 
we see these sometimes when people think that, okay, well, Islam doesn't have anything so or they don't study. So they're like, okay, we're going to go and read, you know, Parenting 101, Parenting for Dummies or something like that. And then they're like, oh, this is what I'm going to do, okay? So it's good to, for us to know. So there, we talked about this. Helicopter parenting is when you're like overprotective, constant involvement. You hover over your child, ev every aspect. They tend to control the environment. Um, they deprive the child a chance to learn things on their own. This parenting style often interferes with a child's development and leads to negative results. Here's my question for you guys. Um, where do you think that would fall under in terms of the, the graph here? So that helicopter approach, where, which one of these does it fall under? Authoritative? Authoritarian. Okay. So it's interesting because it is authoritarian because they're like very much like, you know, you got to do it this way. Um, and yeah, like they, but if you look at it, um, the, they also, ha so authoritarian means that they have a lot of demandingness, right? And they have little warmth, okay? But the funny thing about it is that they're very much involved with their child, right? In, in a way, like, it's these parents over here that are really, like, responsive. They really know, like, they're really kind of in tune with their children. They, they know what's going on. They have a good relationship. So here they have a relationship, but it's not necessarily a positive one, but they're very much aware of what's going on. So it doesn't clearly fit into this model. But definitely, if you wanted to choose one, it would be under authoritarian. authoritarian. Okay? But what, what, I, what I want to say here is that it doesn't, like there are other approaches which don't clearly fit into this. And we got that, that which means that this model isn't necessarily, like it's not all, all encompassing. Okay? There's another one which is called tiger parenting, which is strict and very harsh set of rules, very rigid, very little freedom, emotional abuse such as sh uh, shaming and insulting is often used to force a child to comply. Okay, clearly that is, yeah, okay. Authoritarian, now this is interesting. Free range. It allow children to be more independent than traditional parenting. It's the antithesis of helicopter parenting. You allow the children to make their own decisions. Okay, you wanna be a girl or a boy? Okay, it's up to you. Right, you wanna wear this clothes, this clothes? Okay, you wanna like, whatever, colors, everything, food, you wanna eat, all these things, just pretty much, it's up to you. You can explore your environment, develop into independent adults, you make your choices. Okay, we're Muslims, but you know, I'm gonna give you the choice, you know, whatever you want. This parenting style emphasizes the child's right to make decisions and has been described as a natural parenting style. So fitri, they're trying to find out what is the fitri. That emphasizes self-direction and respect for the child's needs, okay? Now, which one is this one, if we wanted to, what is it? Permissive, uninvolved. They're involved, but they're not neither involved. So, so, so a lot of these, a lot of these do fit with it. Like they're non-directive. They have low expectations. They have few, few roles. Like, kind of like you're the boss. Okay. Um. However. However it's not just purely permissive parenting, right? Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to um, guide that child to their nature, right? Now, the only thing here is that what they understand to be nature isn't like that divinely, you know, sort of inspired nature that God has created with us, like this thing which is like, right? This thing which is supposed to take us to perfection, right? It's something which is basically whatever, you know, your nature in terms of like your animal nature, right? How would you be, you know, if we weren't here to tell you what to do kind of thing, right? So when it comes to faith and even basic things like gender identity and whatnot, it's like really like, you know, like just basic things, like we're not going to tell you, right? So in a way, like it, it's permissive, but permissive with a, uh, with a, uh, an agenda, okay? All right. Now, um, this one? No, so, so what I'm trying to say here is that what they realize, okay, let, let's put this way. What they're realizing is that, you know, we need, these four categories don't necessarily work for us. Like, there's, there's, things, there's, there's things that they don't really, like, address. For example, like, um, what these people are saying is that 
Like, if we don't respect the freedom of the child, then we're not seeing the results that we want. So we're going to give them a lot of freedom, okay? Um, but that freedom is being given not out of negligence or not wanting to be involved. We're very much involved. We're purposely giving them that freedom so that they can go and discover their true nature. So what they're doing is they're trying to fix the, the model, right? But it's still not where we want it to be. And I, I kind of was just, you know, to my side comments, you can see why this is not like what we want to be either, right? I mean, th meaning this is not an Islamic model, but uh, they're trying to fix it, okay? So now it comes time for us to ask the question that what would the Islamic approach be? So here I want to quote um, Marhum Ayatollah Ray Shahri. He just passed away like, I think, you know, some months back. May Allah bless him. He did enormous contribution to, um, you know, the, the Hawza and like his books, like, uh, personally speaking, like, I can't tell you how much I personally have benefited from his books, like Mizan al-Hikmah, and so many, like, works where he, he, he took from the depths of, like, the Quran and, the, and Hadith and, and extracted, like, these incredible teachings, you know, about so many different subjects. Um, there's a whole, like, I have a CD which has, like, all, like, hundreds and hundreds of books, you know, it's just incredible, and may Allah bless him. And, and when, you know, when he passed away, like, um, Ayatul Khamenei, Allah said that like and we never saw anything bad from this person, right? Just you know, very pure individual. In his book, he says that it 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 seems that the Islamic approach, it also accepts these two axes of love and um, and holding somebody to a higher standard and having them accountable. But it adds a third axis, which is extremely important. It has to be considered with the other two, and which is the axis of karama, dignity. Okay, so this, this now changes it. So if we wanted to have a model, we would now create a 3D model maybe with three axes, right? And I, I'm not that sophisticated and we're not going there, but, but you're just, that's something that you guys will have to do, inshallah, when you write the book on it. Okay, but what we can do is now we want to understand what does this mean? So I'm going to now um, ask you guys to chip in here. Okay, that what are some examples where so what we mean by um, here is respect for the child's karama dignity. So what's it, what are some ways, some examples where parents can show love but not respect? And I just want to, just before, because I, I have a lot to say about this topic and examples to give and everything like that, but what would you say is an example of this where, let's say I'm focusing on love and standards, can I potentially miss out on the respect part of it? Yes, sister. Can you, please, thank you. Um, so, for example, like, you can really love a child and, um, and then at the same time not have any respect for their um, individuality, kind of. Like, let's say they really would like to um, explore the field of art, for example, and then they'll tell them, no, but I really, really love you, and I know it's good for you not to go into that field. Yeah because it doesn't make a lot of money and it's because I love you that you can't do this. Right. But in, like, when it comes down to it, it's they're not really respecting right. the child's right. um, Excellent. Excellent need. Example. Yeah, this is, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, you, you know, like, the parent in all their love could be like telling their child, look, I love you. I want you to have a good future, right? I'll love you even more if you go into engineering, right? And, and totally, like, missing out on this dimension. Do you see, like, this in this example, sister, uh, she gave a really good example. Like, this is totally, like, it could, re the way the parent deals with the child could totally change when they keep both of these dimensions in mind. Okay, anybody else? I am, I, so, I'm not a parent, and I don't have any children, and, but I can say one thing is, like, um, I see a lot of parents just giving their phone or like some electronic device to their kid to like, you know, to say like if they're crying or if they're like they're bored, for example, just to like, you know, make them preoccupied. So it, people might say this is like a form of love because, you know, I'm taking away them from being sad or bored, but that isn't the type of respect that you want to give your child, no. I feel like, because you want to like, you know, talk to them, you want to, like, you want to have that relationship with them, 
Right. And your phone can't be that. Right. It can't be like the third parent. Right. Excellent. Excellent. So it, it, yeah, that's a really good example. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, brother. Okay. Um, so there's a question on the YouTube, which is that do these par do these parenting styles create the character and the personality of the child? So what the what these researchers what they said this is very interesting actually, they said that according to their studies of like tens of thousands or like or like sixteen thousand like children and their development somehow they looked at twins and how they develop they said that they 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 realized or they their conclusion was that fifty percent of the way a child is is based on genetics and 50% is based on um, the parenting style. Mm -hmm. So the, the parenting style has a huge impact on what happens to the child. Okay, that's what they said, right? Now, um, we also say that like, you know, that tarbia, the parent, the tarbia um, approach, that the tarbia environment, the tarbia approach that the parents take, um, that plays a huge role in terms of like what's gonna happen with that child's upbringing. Um, but we also know that um, every human being has free will, and let's say somebody didn't have like uh, a very strong tharbia environment, that doesn't become an excuse for them not to like perform their responsibilities to God. So th that's. But anyway, I just wanted to say what they're saying. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing was force them to eat and not respecting their appetites. But like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, like, John. Eat your food. Uh, eat your food. Right, or forcing else. the like your food exactly right. Like yeah, like the prophet says that. Like he says that if you, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says that if you eat what you dislike, it creates stupidity. Right. So, so I mean, uh, let alone like okay, this, I mean, this in terms of like just like okay, well look at if our if our child really doesn't like something, I'm forcing them. Then why am I forcing them? Right. Like I mean, is, is that in line? And then second thing is that exactly like the, is this really showing respect to the, again going back to what Sister Reem said that they're preferences, like their taste, their individuality, right? Like that's something which I need to take into account. Th and especially this, that like I can't assume that somehow the way I am is like the best way, right? And my taste and my preference, right? No, I mean, what if that? What if my child actually has some things which are different but better, right? Okay, excellent. Um, second question, what are some examples where parents can show demandingness but not respect? I mean, this is, this is easy. Anybody? Are you coming or not, right? Like, are you coming or not? Right? Are you gonna like, there's so many things like that. I mean, it happens all the time, right? It's it's really like when we're asking something from our children, then it makes a huge um, difference as to whether we're going to show respect or not. Okay, I have like, w um, because we started a little bit late and I think that this was a new topic, um, we got through um, some of the things. We didn't get to actual practical steps of now, what are we going to do? Um, just as a preview though, just to like, I don't want to leave you guys hanging like for like you know months because uh, you know, I don't know when the next class will be or at least a month. Um, we're going to talk about like calling them with respect. We're going to talk about um, we have some different scenarios here and requesting things from them and then responding to requests as well too. And I know that uh, sister had uh, posted in the in the classroom that okay we hear we looking at these cases of what not to do. Um, but what, how should we do it? So I did take that into account. You know, we do have some scenarios here where it's like how we should do it or some ways of approaching it. But I also want to respect because, uh, you know, your timing as well too. Um, and given that we're at this time, um, I think it's a good time for us to end up. Any last comments or questions before we end up for today? Okay. Salwana Muhammad wa Muhammad. Just wanted to um, take a moment to acknowledge uh, the efforts, especially of uh, Brother Hassan Mirza, who comes every week on time, and he, you know, manages the all the tech part of uh, this class. You know, he's here usually before the rest of us. So may Allah bless him for that. And I wanted to also um, thank all the participants um, for the class, both here locally, um, those who aren't coming in person, those who weren't able to come in person, but they really were diligently following, and many who are following like outside of this local area. Um, mashallah, like you're, I, I haven't seen something like this in terms of like participation, really being serious about the class, doing the homework, giving feedback, like, um, you know, trying to apply, the main thing is like trying to actually like, you know, put, to apply this, you know, and 
um, one of the good things that's happening is that, you know, in some other places, um, you know, the, you know, the, these co this content is going to be reused and be delivered by others in other places. You know, so you guys are the pioneers. You know, and you know your examples that you give, like those are being passed along, and maybe maybe they're going to be shared with other communities. You know, so alhamdulillah, um, this was a, 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 a blessing, like this whole opportunity, and I hope that inshallah we can continue. Um, we just need to work on the functionality part of it. Um, but inshallah, and, and maybe we need to figure out a uh, time that will work, work better for everyone. Do you have final? Your final is to do all your homework. Um, I will inshallah post a date, but probably like in a few weeks when I have all the homework done, and then that's it then, inshallah. Okay. Um, one more salawat, please. Oh, and um, I won't be able to be here for the prayers today, so just to let you know, I'm sure that some of you will, will be here, and inshallah one of the brothers will lead it, but I personally have to leave um, the, be home by prayers.